Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm a grateful alcoholic. My name is George. Hi, everybody. Uh... Uh, I was going to say what I started off with last week. This is my favorite step. No, it's really not my favorite step. This is a step I had the most problem with. But I did today, it is probably the most important step of all the steps I ever had to take uh, in any part of my life. Uh, as far as this program is concerned, is the third step. I'm going to talk about an event somewhere along the line here tonight that happened when I did my first, my first third step. I do a third step every day. That's just what I do. It's a recommitment step for me. And it's something that I have to be willing to do on a daily basis. Because I believe if I don't ask my God in on a daily basis, he'll let me do whatever I want. And uh, I'll probably pay a consequence. So it's about letting go and letting God, not letting go and letting George. Uh, That's the third step for me, real simply put. Uh, We read, and we don't read it enough uh, in certain areas, uh, how it works from beginning to end in most meetings that I've been to when I first got sober. I always like to read, even though it's not approved AA literature. To me, it was very important because uh, we talk about the ABCs a lot uh, in a lot of beginners' meetings, steps one, two, and three. It's a lot of different ways we look at this. But I like the original manuscript reading of how it works, and I'm going to read it today. And you guys who know how it works and hear it enough, I'm going to emphasize it, or I'm going to do my best to emphasize those parts that have changed from the original manuscript into what we read in the big book today. Uh, Really, have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our directions? Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping, and developing a way of life which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose, in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to follow directions. At some of these, you may balk. You may think you can find an easier, softer way. We doubt if you can. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil till we let go absolutely. Remember that you are dealing with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for you. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. You must find him now. Half measures will avail you nothing. You stand at a turning point. Throw yourself utterly under his protection and care with complete abandon. Um, Now we think you can take it. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as your program of recovery. One, admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and lives over to the care and direction of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely willing that God remove all these defects of character from us. Seven, humbly, on our knees, ask that, ask him to remove all our shortcomings, holding nothing back. Eight, <coughs> made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make complete amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 
11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual experience as the result of this course of action, we tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics, and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You might exclaim, what an order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal inventions before and after have been designed to sell you these three pertinent ideas. A, that you are alcoholic and cannot manage your own life. B, that probably no human power can relieve your alcoholism. And C, that God can and will. If you are not convinced of these vital issues, you ought to reread the book to this point, or else throw it away. Uh, I love that reading because I had to get directions, not suggestions. Had I been given suggestions, I'd say I'd take this one, but not that one. Uh, my life wasn't unmanageable if people behaved the way I wanted them to. There was a lot of powers. I talked about the uh, last week about how the second tradition led me to a second step. Money, property, and prestige diverted me from any kind of relationship with any power or entity that moved in these rooms when I first got here. I get to this third step, and you're asking me to try something that I had a lot of problems with. Believe in God. Uh, beginning was good orderly direction, group of drunks. And I'm going to jump around between one, two, and three, because the third step is all about, for me, is how do I, how did I jump around in my recovery? Uh, in the big book, the promise of the second step, and there is a promise to the second step. It says that uh, quite as important was the discovery that spiritual principles would solve all my problems. That's a promise of the second step. That promise was very important to me because I was one of those, and if you read in There is a Solution, it talks about um, the childhood uh, upbringing that I had. It gave me certain conceptions of God. And I talked a lot about God as a child. I was going to be of a religious cloth when I was growing up. I was studying for that stuff. But of course, by the time I was seven years old, God uh, deserted me because of the way he took my grandfather. And by the time I was 13, uh, God and I weren't even talking anymore. I, until the time I was 44. Actually, there was a time once that I remember speaking to God. It was when my daughter was born and she was born, born sick. And I prayed that day. And as soon as she was okay 14 days later, God and I weren't talking again until 1994. That was from 1982. So there was a long process, 1984. There was a long process where God and I were not on speaking terms. And there are days today that God and I aren't speaking terms. Uh, I speak to him every day, and sometimes the best prayer I have is help me not drink today. And that's the only prayer I make. I don't ask for his will for me. I don't ask him what I can do to help anybody. Just let me not drink and get through this day. Because I still am a human being with human frailties. And that's real important to me going into this third step. Because there's a lot of things blocking me from the sunlight of the spirit. There's that second step again. That second step is key to me of how I got to step three. And there's only one way to get to step three, and it's by practicing it. Whether I believe in it or not, I need to practice it. What does it talk to us about in the back of the spiritual uh, experience? It says there are three things that are essential to recovery. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. I hear people say that's steps one, two, and three. No, that's the essentials to getting recovery. It's not step one, it's not step two, step three. I hear ABCs in the back. It's steps one, two, and three, not the way I learned it. The way I learned it, and all I have is the way I was given to me, is A, is that uh, uh, I was an alcoholic and not can, could not manage my own life. That is my admittance step. My first step, yes, it's my admittance. And the second part of it is that no human power, no human power, no wife, no girlfriend, no job, no human power, nothing on this earth can relieve my alcoholism. That's my acceptance. 
That's where I come to the acceptance of my alcoholism. And that God can and will. And I say that when we say God could and would if he saw it. I still say God can and will. That's the convergence. Now, that's a, a spiritual term. It's a religious term. And what it means is that I've been willing to change my attitudes and my actions to this God that I didn't understand when I got here. So how do I get there? Willingness is the only answer. I had to be willing to trust in a process I didn't believe was going to work for me. I did a first step with a sponsor. I did a second step with a sponsor. Uh, my mom was in and out of being very ill. He speeded me up. He slowed me down. And uh, July 4th of 1994, uh, my sponsor, Larry S., asked me if I would uh, go with him to see the fireworks at FAU. I went over to see the fireworks. And after the fireworks, uh, he said, I need a meeting. I, and on the way to going to this meeting, he said, by the way, is there any place you know that may be open that we can pray? Well, there's a temple that I talked about right around the corner here, and there's a church right around the corner here, and one is Joan of Arc and the temple over there, and uh, they're both closed at that time of night, but it's a nice place to go. And the 4th of July was over, and the fireworks were over at FAU, and we drove down there, we had dinner, and we pulled up underneath uh, in uh, Joan of Arc, Underneath uh, the uh, the stat one of the statues there, and uh, the fireworks were going off. And he asked me on the third step, you people who know that, on the third step down from the top to kneel down there and pray with him. I never kneeled with anybody. Uh, I kneeled and I did the third step prayer. This is my experience. Uh, I didn't have a lightning bolt experience. Nothing happened. Nothing felt good. I did it because I was with my sponsor and he asked me to do it, so I did it. Didn't believe it was working. Didn't think it was working for me. Uh, he asked me if I was uh, if uh, I was willing to turn my will and my life over to care of God, and I said no. He said, "Let me ask you the question that I asked you when you read the third step with me. Are you willing to turn it over to the care of the rest of the steps?" And I said, "Absolutely." Although I did a third step there, and although I had this event, and it was a wonderful event, I still was not on convers in conversations with God yet. So he said to me, is there a place we can go find the meeting? And in that time, uh, there was a group that was on at the Veritas building, which is the, uh, doesn't matter the name of the group, I don't like to do that. Uh, we went up to that meeting, and, they, and because of the 4th of July, the bridges were closed, and they couldn't get over. So it was just him and I in there, and we opened the book called As Bill Sees It, which is AA-approved literature, and we were reading out of it. And he said, well, I'll give it five more minutes, and... Uh, and then I uh, will go home. And just as we were leaving, a guy by the name of Artie walked in, and I'm not going to use his last name. He was around five years at the time in 1994. Uh, and, he, and the three of us sat down for seven and a half hours and just had conversations. And I realized that not only did I, my, I didn't know, I didn't feel my third step yet, but I knew I did a first step. See, that's how my steps have come to me. As I'm finishing one step, I'm realizing a step or two before is falling into place. I realized I had a first and second step in place. Still didn't feel the third step yet. But I knew something of that moment had changed. Something different happened. Uh, as I work with sponsees and I, and, I, and I read a lot and I do pray a lot today, uh, the third step to me is key. It's key to my whole recovery. Uh, and without that third step, I don't believe I would stay in recovery. And that's to me. I know there are people in this fellowship uh, there's a guy by the name of Joe L. who lost his God in Alcoholics Anonymous. He's a very good friend of mine. He's got 57 years of recovery. He believes there's an entity that works through the rooms. That's his higher power, but he doesn't believe in God. And you don't have to believe in God to get sober and stay sober. I do, but other people don't. I needed to find a God of my understanding. And that God of my understanding keeps changing in the third step. And I don't believe that God has changed from the day I walked in here. What has changed is my perception of that God. Uh, putting that down as the foundation of where I'm going, I want to get into our literature uh, because solving all, you know, um, uh, solving all my problems, all my problems. I had a wife problem, I had a job problem, I had an ex-girlfriend problem, I had, a, I had a living situation because I lived in one of the fractional houses right around the corner from here. Uh, problem. I had all kinds of problems. Alcohol was not my problem. Alcohol was my solution, as well as other substances. Now you're asking me to give that up, and I'm really uh, caught in this stage of complete insanity while being sober. 
uh, I was not sane. And, you know, step, step two says we could be restored to sanity. It doesn't say we will be. Uh, here's what it says. It tells us, like, the remaining steps. Step three calls for affirmative action. It is only by action that we cut away the self-will, which has always blocked the entry of God, or, if you like, a higher power into our lives. It talks about faith in the third step in the 12 and 12. I used to say I had no faith. I had a lot of faith. I had no problem walking into a bar, the bartender knowing me, and expecting to get top shelf liquor as soon as I walked in. Could have given me watered down stuff by the end of the night. I never would have known. But I expected top shelf. I had a lot of faith in the bartender. I had a lot of faith when there was a little hole in the wall and I stuck my money in there that I would get what I was paying for. A lot of faith in a lot of things. You come in here and ask me to use the faith of this fellowship and I tell you I can't do it. That's my defiance. That's my rebellion. That's my delusion. That's all the thing that keeps me from that sunlight of the spirit that has blocked me since I've got here. So it says a little later on, faith to be sure is necessary, but faith alone can avail us nothing. We can have faith, yet keep God out. I had a lot of faith in a lot of things. I had a lot of faith in my job, in my, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of things in my life, but I didn't have faith in God. And I was afraid to believe in God because I thought God didn't believe in me. Talked about that in step two last week. Uh, Therefore, our problem now becomes how and just by what specific means shall we be able to let him in? Step rep, step three represents our first attempt to do that. And it's only an attempt. And I had a lot of misgivings to that third step. And, you know, the literature tells us about people like me. It says, fortunately, for, uh, for us who have tried with equal misgivings, we can testify that anyone, anyone at all, can make a beginning. Anyone can make a beginning. What's the beginning? beginning, I was told, is to ask God of my non-understanding, or my sponsor's God at the time, I'd say, God, that's taking care of Bob, will you keep an eye on me and not let me drink today, and drug or hurt anybody. And at the end of the day, I was told to say thank you. Real simple stuff when I got here. Uh, today, that's not the, my understanding of the God I have today. I still ask God that I don't understand to this day. I don't understand God. God's doing a fine job without my help. He understands me just fine. My job is to speak to him. And uh, he shows himself to me through people. I believe my God has skin. That's just the way I believe. Uh, it tells us, uh, it says, if we make a beginning, even the smallest, that's all that is needed. And once we place the key of willingness in the lock, in the lock to a door that seems closed, um, it will, we find that it will always open some more. The more willing I was to do this step, the more willing people were to help me and get me into a right relationship with my fellow man and God himself. Uh, a little later on in the third step in the 12 and 12, it says, the more we come, become willing to depend on a higher power, the more independent we really are. Therefore, dependence, as AA practices, really means the gaining of true independence of the spirit. The more dependent I was in, in, in trusting in the process that I didn't think was going to work, the more I started feeling God into my heart. And the more I spot, not in my head anymore. Now it was getting from my head to my heart, that 18-inch walk that I could never make. And that's where God started entering me now. Uh, and then it talks about the minute we, our mental and emotional uh, independence in question, how differently we behave, uh, how persistently we claim the right to decide all by ourselves just how we shall think and just how we shall act. Uh, you know, the step says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. Now, what is, first of all, the big word in step three for me is the word care. And not turning my will and life over to God, it's the care. When my car breaks down, I have no problem driving to the mechanic and turning my car over to the care of the mechanic. He will fix it and tell me when it's done, and I will come and pay him and go on my way. It's real simple. How do I do that with God? Um, first, got to figure out what my will is and what my life is. And for me, it was made real simple. His where sponsorship paid off. My will is my thoughts, and my life is my actions. And if I have that part figured out, then it's real easy to take my thoughts and my action over to the power of AA, which in, later brings me to the God of my understanding. So it says, uh, you know, we talk about, yeah, I'm willing, but when my ex-wife didn't want to speak to me or wouldn't let me speak to the kids, or when my job in New York said, don't come back, or like now I'm going through some stuff with the courts in New York and they're not behaving the way I want, how differently I want to behave. And what I've learned is I learned some other steps along the way, and I was told to treat everybody today the way I want to be treated tomorrow, so I don't yell at the person at the other end of the phone today. 
uh, at the beginning, I wasn't that serene. I was yelling and screaming at everybody that was in my path because they weren't behaving the way I wanted. Uh, it tells us no one's going to meddle in, in our personal independence in such matters. Besides, we think there's no one we can trust. And that's what this is really the step is about for me, is about trust. I had a trust in a process that wasn't understandable to me. It was beyond my comprehension. And I thought I was a pretty smart guy, but, you know, the God of my upbringing, my religious God, was not the God of AA. It was a different God I was learning in here. I was learning about things that were different than the way I looked at them, the way I believed in them. Uh, my belief system started changing. And so it is by circumstance, rather than by any virtue, that I was driven here. I like to say, you know, people say, how did I get to AA? I said, this is where the druggy buggy dropped me off. This is how I got driven to AA. I didn't have a car. I had a little bicycle, and from a bicycle I had a little scooter that had an engine on it. And then I eventually got a real scooter. And then six years later I got a car, and I never got a DUI. So that was just insanity that went on in my early recovery. And I didn't, you know, I, I was driven here. And I always joke about being how I was driven here. And when I got here, I admitted defeat. I was broken. I was beat up. I came out from under a bridge. That's where my bottom was. But that bottom is no different than somebody who is on Park Avenue and says, emotionally, they're done. Zero up here or zero down here. Under a bridge is still zero. We're all equal. This is where the great equalizer, when we walk in this room. And that's where the grace of God starts entering my life. Um, it tells us, it says, we have admitted defeat, have acquired the rudiments of faith, and now want to make a decision to turn our will and lives over to a power, that, to that higher power. So how exactly can a willing person continue to turn his will and life to a higher power? He made a beginning, we see, when he commenced to reply, love, rely upon AA for a solution to his alcohol problem. By now, though, the chances are that he's become convinced there's more problems than alcohol. I was convinced of that because... Before I walked in here, alcohol was my solution, not my problem. Now I come in here, find out I'm an alcoholic, because you guys tell me that. I didn't know I was that either. Uh, I learned that in AA. Uh, what ended up happening is now I had all these other problems were, were piling up on me, and I wasn't talking to God, and I was miserable in AA. And I wanted to drink a lot at that time. Uh, I didn't drink in spite of that. And it says... And some of these will not be solved by the sheer personal determination and all the courage he can muster. They simply will not budge. They make him desperately unhappy, which I was. They threaten his newfound sobriety, which it did. Our friend is still victimized by remorse and guilt when he thinks of yesterday. Very a lot of guilt and shame when I walk in here. Mm. Bitterness still overpowers him when he broods upon those he still envies or hates, which was the whole world. His financial insecurities worry him sick, and panic takes over when he thinks of the bridges to safety, the alcohol burn behind him. And how shall he ever straighten out that awful jam that cost him the affection of his family and separated him from them? His lone courage and unaided will cannot do it. Surely he must now depend upon somebody or something else. Uh, that somebody or something else at the beginning was my sponsor. That was my first higher power in AA. And I was told by him that I couldn't rely on him because he was fallible, because he was human. The ABCs, back to those ABCs, that no human power could relieve my alcohol. But he put me on the right direction. Uh, then it became the group, the group of drunks, good orderly direction. I used every excuse in the world, but never called it God. And all the time it was God. It was God all along, but not my vision, because I didn't want it to be. I wanted choice to be God, and that wasn't working out. Uh, it tells us that our friend's life was still un unmanageable. I was here seven months. I was still unmanageable. I was just served with papers at six months to get my children up. The reason I came into AA, I was battling everybody and everything, and there was no serenity and no peace to be had. And the book talks about that. It says, even though he is sober, and that after all, only a bare start on the AA program uh, has, is being made. More sobriety brought about by the admission of alcoholism, first step, and the attendance at a few meetings is very good indeed, but it's bound cry from permanent sobriety in a contented, useful life. What a promise that is. Permanent sobriety and a contented, useful life. I felt like useless and hopeless and helpless when I got here. Now you're going to tell me that there's hope that I can be useful again. I didn't believe that would ever happen for me. 
That's just where the remaining steps of the AA program come in. Uh-oh, we're back to those steps again. Third step, made a decision to turn my will in life over to carry the rest of the steps. Nothing short of continuous action. Uh, upon these, the way of life can bring the much desired result. Nothing short of continuous actions. In our big book, it tells us that uh, it's vital to permanent recovery, that one alcoholic work with another. Permanent recovery. There's that permanent recovery. Relapse is not a requirement of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I'm one of those that walked in January 19th of 1994, and I still have, by the grace of God, and that's the only reason I came here, that very first white ship I had. That does not mean I cannot drink tonight or tomorrow. What it means is it's based on my relationship with that God that I didn't understand that was protecting me from the day I walked in. I love footprints. I'm one of those that God carried for a very long time. I believe God loves babies and alcoholics. I really believe that. Uh, there's a, it really does. Uh, as, as, as I stay here, I realize he loves alcoholics a lot. Um, in our big book, it says, Besides the seeming inability to accept much on faith, we found ourselves handicapped by obstinacy. Now, if you're like me, that's a very nice word. That's a nice word of telling you how defiant and what a, I'm right and you're wrong kind of thing. I was obstinate about everything when I got here. Uh, sensitiveness and unreasoning prejudice. You want to see what blocked me from the sunlight of spirit? Well, it tells me what's blocking me. It's blocking me from my third step. Many of us have been so touchy, even casual reference to spiritual things made us bristle with antagonism. This sort of thing had to be abandoned. Though some of us resisted, we found no great difficulty in casting aside such feeling. Faced with alcoholic destruction, we soon became open-minded on spiritual matters that we had tried to have been on other questions. In this respect, alcohol is the great persuader. There's another part in, of our, in some of our other literature which says there are two authorities. There's a loving God who says, do my will, and there's alcohol that says, if you don't do my will, I'm, alcohol's going to kill you. And I'm not willing to pay that price anymore. So I better do God's will. And it tells us a little later on in uh, our traditions, and this is out of our traditions, it tells us that... Uh, that um, we do these things first because we have to, and then because we want to. We love the discipline that we get in AA. I didn't love it when I got here. Believe me, I didn't. But today I love that discipline that was laid out before me by the people who walked this path before me. Uh, and then a little later on in our big book, it talks about the gadget, the old idea of being cast aside for a new one, one of my favorite parts of the big book, page 52. Uh, it says... Uh, is not our age characterized which in, in which we disregard old ideas for new with by a complete readiness to which throw away the old theory or gadget, which does not work for us with for something which does. It's amazing. AA was working for me, and people told me what to do, and I said, oh, it ain't going to work for me. I was still sitting there arguing, and I've been sober now for a bunch of months. I wasn't happy yet, but I was sober. And for someone like me who could not, not drink for so long, uh, that was a miracle. I just didn't see it. We see what we need to see when it's time to see it. Um, it tells us uh, also, uh, we ask ourselves, why shouldn't we apply to our human problem the same readiness to change our point of view? We are, we, we're, we, we're not having trouble with relationships. We could not control emotional natures. We were prey to misery and depression. We could not make a living. Uh, we had the feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We weren't happy. We couldn't seem to be real help to other people. When we saw others solve their problems by a simple reliance on the spirit of the universe, we had to stop doubting the power of God. Our ideas did not work, but the God idea did. And here I am again, faced with that same spot, against that same wall, having the same resistance, and God is opening me up every way he can, and I'm still fighting. Uh, a little later on, it says, we had we, we found, too, that we had been worshipers. Worshippers. What a state of mental goose flesh that used to bring on. Had we not ver ver variously worshipped people, sentiment, things, money, and ourselves, and then with a better motive, have we not worshipably beheld the sunset, the sea, or a flower? Who of us have not loved somebody or something? How much these feelings, these loves, these worship have to do with pure reason? Little or nothing we saw at last. Were not these the tissue of which our lives were constructed? Did not these feelings, after all, determine the course of our existence? It was impossible to say we had no capacity for faith or love or worship. In one form or another, we have been living by faith and little else. You know, I, my sponsor used to joke with me all the time 
you keep saying you have no faith. He says, you walk in here every day to the same meeting, sit in a different chair, and as long as you've been here, you never turn it over to see if the screws are in place to the chair all the You always had faith. You just had a bad perception of what faith is. Uh, I don't get biblical often. This is the one time I do. Uh, you know, there's a part in the Bible that says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that, to me, is probably the best uh, definition of faith that I have. There was things I hoped for when I walked in here. That was the second step. I saw it in others. And the evidence, I had to stick around long enough to find it. And that was the gift of the third step. Uh, it tells us, actually, we're fooling ourselves. But deep down in every man, woman, and child, there's a fundamental idea of God. It may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, by worship of other things. In some form or another, it was there. For a power greater than ourselves and miraculous demonstrations of that power in human lives are as fact as old as man himself. We finally saw that faith of some kind of God was part of our makeup, just as we had the feelings we have for a friend. Sometimes we had to search fearlessly, but he was there. We had, he has, was as much of a fact as we were. We found the great reality deep within us. In the last analysis, it was there that he was to be found, and so it was with us. With me, I, it was the deep reality was God was with me all along. If I got what I deserved, I'm grateful for mercy, not justice. I say it that way. Uh, if I got the justice that I deserved, I was talking to someone before the meeting about justice. If we got what we deserved, for all the times I was woken up with a cop over me and an ambulance over me, taking me to somewhere because I had a psychosis event, Nice way of saying I overdosed. Uh, uh, and and I, as soon as I opened my eyes, I took off on the cops, and on my way to wherever I was going, I had to have more of whatever it was I needed, mostly alcohol. I would call the uh, Chinese restaurant and have them send me up sake. I would do whatever I needed to to get my next drink or my next fix. And, you know, and that, that's what I did. That's the way I lived my life. Um, and it tells us, who is this to say there is no God? Uh, that was always a p problem with me because I was searching for God for many years. I talk about my journey through Est and TM and uh, Pyramid Power and Seth, and all the different ways I searched for God through Judaism, through Eastern religion, through Christianity. I was still searching for God. I was trying to put in a face on something that would be with me all along. I just never bothered looking in the right place. And all of them worked. And then this is the only other time I'm going to get biblical. I think during this, these, these, uh, 12 weeks, and this is, you know, there's a part in the Bible that says there are many ma mansions within the, the house of the Lord. To me, that means there's room for every religion and every concept there is. It can mean whatever you want it to mean, but that's what it means to me. And in AA, I found that out, because we're all equal when we walk in this door. And it's not about my religious upbringing. It's about a relationship with the God that you people started to introduce me to. Uh, we talk about... Being convinced, I love this, because step three is in two places in the big book. We were at step three. All right? And it says we are now at step three, and then being convinced we're at step three. When we are now at step three, it talks about my favorite person, me. Uh, and it talks about selfishness and self-centeredness. We think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-illusion, self-seeking, self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us. Seemingly without provocation, but it would invariably find out we made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, although he usually doesn't think so. Above everything else, we must get rid of selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. Whether I like it or not, we're going to talk about God. And that's what I was told when I got here. Uh, the God of my understanding um, <laughs> was wonderful when I got in here because my God understanding of God was your understanding of God. I would have done anything not to drink again. My sponsor would have told me to stand in the middle of, of Federal Highway on my head and stay there for five hours. I would have done that every day he told me I wouldn't drink. My sponsor did something different. He grabbed me and he took me into a bar to deal with a wet drunk. At, at 30 days, at 60 days, at six months, that's what I was doing. He told me that was what was going to keep me sober, is working with others. 
He told me that's how I was going to find the God of my understanding. And every time I saw somebody who was in the chaos, he made me go down. He didn't make me do anything, but he made me. He had me go down to Broward Boulevard during the holidays and feed the homeless to bring in brown bags to make up for the behaviors that I had while I was in my act of alcoholism. When I used to go into the um, uh, soup kitchens in New York to get a free meal because I needed the money for alcohol. So that was my way of making amends. But that was also my way of getting into a better relationship with a God that I didn't understand yet, who was working in my life. And it says, uh, when we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer being all-powerful. provided uh, He provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Established on such footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs, more and more, we became interested in seeing what we can contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, we enjoyed a peace of mind. As we discovered we could face life successfully, we became conscious of his presence, became lose our fear of today, tomorrow, or the hereafter. We were reborn. What a wonderful gift that is, is to walk into these rooms, and we talk about it a little later on in one of the other steps, to watch someone move from darkness into light. Is an experience you won't want to miss. That rebirth happened to me in AA. And nothing really changed. I still had the same problems I did from the very first day I walked in here at six months and at seven months and at a year. They may have changed in the way they were. I was approaching them. My perception has changed. But those problems were still with me. And the problem I've learned in step three is never the problem. The problem is my attitude to the problem. You know, I can sit here for an hour and tell you how, what a great relationship I have with my God. You can hear and say wonderful things about me. Don't listen to what I say. Watch what I do. My feet have to match my mouth. Because the day they don't, I'll drink again. And that's what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can give it a lot of lip service, but what are my feet doing? What, you know, somebody's telling me, you know, on the way here, they were watching what I'm doing and I'm being a good example. You know, and I said to them, well, nobody told me what to do. They showed me what to do. They showed me what to do through the literature. They showed me what to do when I became a coffee maker. They showed me what to do when I did my first meeting. All those things were bringing me into a better relationship with the God of my understanding. Um, we are now at step three. <laughs> now we're now going to find out that, that selfishness and self-centered is my problem. What do I do? I make a third step prayer. Uh, sometimes my third step prayer is don't let me drink. Other times it's uh, relieve me of the bondage yourself. Uh, I have a whole bunch of different ones that I say because I don't like saying empty words. I have to feel what I'm saying today. Uh, and, you know, uh, we always say uh, the third step prayer, uh, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Uh, I learned one thing about the third step. I cannot think my way into good acting anymore. The third step taught me how to act my way into good thinking. Uh, the principles that I got out of doing the third step, I said this last week, as I, each week I'm going to give a few of the principles that I found. There are other principles. There are many. And a principle, as we said right from the beginning, is a rule of uh, a rule of or a code of conduct, a basic truth or an assumption. Some of the principles that I got in the third step was the practice of the third step, the willingness to go forward, faith, reflection, action, acceptance, affirmative action, God Himself, a higher power, effectiveness, practi pra being practical, caring. Protection, guidance, inst inst instructive, achieving, um, dependence, understanding, trust. One of the biggest things I got in my third step was to trust in something I couldn't see. Peace, brotherhood, strength, endurance, learning, solution, determination, courage, admission, affection, God dependency. Uh, contentment, usefulness, persistence, spirit, quiet purposeful wisdom, and most importantly, the word that none of us likes to hear, humility. Humbly, I speak to God. Um, and some days it's not so humble. Some days me yelling at God is okay, because that's what I need to do. God will take me any way I come, but I have to come to him. My God is such a gentleman, he will not enter my life if I don't ask him in. I believe that. 
and my God is all powerful. Uh, I am one of those that believe that God and I together can accomplish anything on any given day. Uh, God has graced me in so many ways throughout my recovery. I've come through times of illness. I've come through separations. I've come through deaths. Uh, God has been with me every step of the way. And I've gotten to meet some wonderful people that have a wonderful relationship with God. And it's because of people like you in rooms like these that I have a God of my understanding today. Thank you for letting me share on stuff with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.